Okay, so um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, as you already heard, my interest is um, in, in fly motion vision. And uh, you will see that uh, my really deep interest is to understand how nerve cells compute. And I hope to convince you that uh, fly motion vision is a, a great example for that, for neural computation at the level of single nerve cells, how they wire up, how they build a little circuit, and then do some interesting computation. Right? And <clears throat> we'll see that, uh, first of all, motion vision is an extremely important visual cue that is used for visual navigation by all of you here, all animals that have eyes. It's used for predator and prey detection. So it's really extremely important for the nervous system to extract the direction of motion from the series of images that fall on the retina. And you will see also that it is an interesting computation that is algorithmically extremely well defined. So you know like the boundaries of what the circuit has to do. And you will also see that in the fly visual system, this is done, this computation, by just a handful of neurons. And uh, so it's a small neural circuit. And we can manipulate each of the participating neurons in almost any way we want. So this is uh, great for doing experiments. But let's start by showing you the importance of visual motion first. So um, here, for example, you see, uh, or you will see, that uh, motion vision is important for object detection. Uh, if you don't, uh, if I don't uh, animate this uh, movie here, you will see just a little branch, right? But, um, okay. but uh, as soon as it starts moving, you will see that, you know, look at that. There is actually a spider there, you know. And without the spider moving, you wouldn't have recognized that there is something there, right? But um, so many animals use this strategy, for example. They know that, you know, move, not moving is, uh, provides a camouflage. And so uh, many, like lizards, for example, you know, they j just run, you know, short episodes and then stand still most of the time. So they are hidden by not moving. And motion breaks the camouflage. But beside object detection, you can also recognize objects. You can see what's there. And this, uh, for example, here uh, is probably not recognized as anything uh, unless it starts moving then all of a sudden you see that there's a walking man, right? And, <clears throat> and another example is self-motion. If you yourself move through space, then all the images on your retina of the environment move constantly. And the, the way, the particular way that they move indicates to you what you're doing in space. And for that, you know, this little movie of a roller coaster ride here shows to you uh, how these images look like if you sat in a roller coaster in an amusement park like that. And uh, if this was projected on a wide screen, like an IMAX theater, you know, some of you might get motion sick. And, you know, your stomach would, you know, every time you go over the hill, you know, you feel your stomach getting up. And it's purely vision. And so people running these amusement parks nowadays almost all go to virtual roller coaster rides. So you just sit in an audience, in a lecture hall like this. You're surrounded, you know, 180 degree screen. And then they play such movies to you. And you have as much fun as if you sat in a real roller coaster. And it's just vision. Motion vision just indicates to you, gives you a very strong hint of how you move through space. So um, I hope you got the point. Motion vision is very important. Uh, why is it an interesting computation? And why do we need computation at all to extract the direction of motion? Well, here you see a schematic of the fly visual system. And in red, you see the retina, and the retina is you know, split up in little facets that house the photoreceptors, 
eyes have facet eyes. And it's followed by several layers of neuropil called the lamina, medulla, lobula, and lobular plate. And here in the lobular plate, there are white field so-called tangential cells, um, about 20 different on each side of the drosophila brain, and they will be very play an important role later in my talk. So now, you know, we do this little, you know, thought experiment. We take a bar and we move it in front of the fly to the right and to the left again. Now, when you take an electrode and record from a photoreceptor, as an individual photoreceptor, this photoreceptor will respond the same during rightward as well as to during leftward motion. So if you look at the signal of this photoreceptor, you cannot tell in which direction the bar has moved. It is a non-directional response. Now you take uh, the electrode and stick it a few synapses downstream into one of these tangential cells and you see something else. Now you see a directional response. This neuron, for example, depolarizes in response to rightward motion and it hyperpolarizes in response to downward mo uh, leftward motion. So the first one is called the preferred direction and the other one is called the null direction of this neuron. By looking at the output of this neuron, you can tell the direction of motion, right? So you, we go from a non-directional to a directional response. How can that be, right? Requires computation. And this computation has been defined by Hassenstein and Reichert more than 50 years ago in their famous Hassenstein-Reichert detector model. And they did behavioral experiments on uh, this beetle that was walking on this spherical Y maze. And from these quantitative behavioral measurements concluded such a uh, model to underlie uh, motion vision. And that's what they called an elementary motion detector. And they assumed that this computation is going on between each of these facets. So you have a two-dimensional array of such local motion detectors that cover somehow the whole visual field of the animal. Their output signals are then pooled and drive this what is called an optomotor following reaction of the beetle. Now, this is the full-blown model that they published in 56. And the essence of this model is shown here. So as you can see, this motion detector model consists of two subunits, mirror symmetrical subunits, that share the same two inputs. And these uh, bowls here you know, uh, should represent photoreceptors. And within each subunit, the signal from one photoreceptor is low pass filtered, that is delayed in time, and subsequently multiplied with the instantaneous signal from the neighboring photoreceptor. And that's done twice in these mirror symmetrical subunits, and then you have a subtraction stage, and out comes a direction selective signal the way that I just showed to you before that you've seen in the tangential cells. So this was an extremely important model um, in uh, uh, neuroscience, and uh, it just it does not, you know, just in principle explains direction selectivity. It makes a, a number of quantitative and rather counterintuitive predictions, and I just want to give you three examples that we have tested um, in the fly visual system. So um, the first one is the following. If you take a sign grading, periodic grading of stripes, and you move it in front of an array of these motion detectors at various velocities, so velocity is plotted on the x-axis here, then you see that unlike a simple speedometer, the model predicts that there is an optimum velocity where the model response the strongest. And if you go this beyond this optimum velocity, the response of the model goes down again, right? So you have this optimum velocity. And furthermore, if you take sign gradings of different spatial wavelengths, 
different bar widths or stripe widths, then you have different uh, optimum velocities. So this is a quantitative prediction that we and others have tested in the fly visual system, and this is the outcome. You know, nicely confirmed, uh, perfect fit. Um, now, this is uh, what you know, scientists call a steady state response. That is, if you move the grading for some time so that everything has settled to a stable response. Um, when I entered the field, I was in particular intrigued by transient dynamic response properties of the system. And I came up with uh, a computer simulation just when I had started my postdoc time in 84. And the first thing, this was at the institute in Tübingen where Reichert was working and he was the hero. He was the god, he was the father of the model. So I thought that I could not provide anything new and interesting. So I programmed the computer, you know, and um, I simulated the response of this model to a velocity step. If you have a grading and you start moving it at a constant velocity, so you have a velocity step. How does the response of this array of Reichert, uh, Hasselstein Reichert detectors look like? And what I saw from the simulations was this oscillation before it settles to steady state. You know, no one has ever told me about that before. Um, I made sure that I had programmed everything correctly, no mistakes. Uh, um, didn't want to make a fool of myself. Um, it was, you know, uh, that was the truth, so to say of the model. The uh, question was whether the neurons in the fly brain also show that. And so with my colleague Martin Egelhoff uh, and later with uh, others, you know, this is what you get from a recording uh, of a motion sensitive tangential cells in the fly. It really shows this ringing and the ringing frequency is exactly at the temporal frequency of the uh, grating. Uh, and even more fantastic prediction um, is the following. Uh, when you um, move the, such a grating with a white noise velocity profile, so it's jittering back and forth, and so you have a distribution of different velocities, and you pick a very narrow distribution, so the maximum velocities are very, very, very small. Then under these conditions, this, um, you get the following uh, blue line, which is the velocity gain control, and the velocity gain is very high, saying that under these conditions, with the small distribution, narrow distribution, the detector is very sensitive. But if you use a broad velocity distribution, so you have high velocities in both directions, then this detector becomes automatically very insensitive. It has a low gain, a flat slope here. And it does that automatically without any parameter uh, uh, adaptation. And so this was very fantastic. And we tested that again in the fly visual system. And uh, indeed, the neurons also show this velocity gain adaptation. Um, so uh, I was really convinced after all these exercises that this model is a faithful description of what's going on between the fly photoreceptors and those tangential cells in the lobular plate that we recorded from. Um, and to me, this model really is at the same rank as the Hodgkin-Huxley model. And I've never seen you know, a better uh, in neuroscience. So it was like a natural question to ask, you know, what neurons are doing these uh, computations that are specified in this algorithmic model. So let's take a look at what cells are presynaptic to the tangential cells. So we take a horizontal cross section through the fly optic lobe and look at what I call columnar neurons. These are those neurons that live once per column in the optic lobe. And you can see that there are the photoreceptors that send their processes from uh, the, the facet into the lamina. And then here in the lamina, the first neuropil, these signals are taken up by lamina cells that then send their axons into the next neuropil layer, the medulla. And within the medulla, there are all kinds of, of uh, interneurons 
that either connect different layers within the medulla or connect medulla to lobular or lobular plate. And there are in particular two cell types that I will get back to later in the talk called T4 and T5 cells that terminate in the lobular plate where these large tangential cells live and they either bring the signal here from this layer of the medulla or from this layer in the lobula into the lobular plate. Now interestingly, these neurons have first been drawn by Ramon y Cajal, um, um, yeah, about 99 years ago. And he was the first to apply this Golgi stain to the insect uh, visual system and has published this beautiful account um, almost 100 years ago. And he has also seen and noticed the T4 and T5 cells. And this is a T4 cell, and these are T5 cells. <clears throat> a very beautiful drawing with all the details. Now, a full account of all the various types of interneurons that we have in the uh, Drosophila optic lobe was given in 89, again based on Golgi staining, by uh, Fischbach and Dietrich. And they published this catalog of all the different cell types. And um, they comprise about 100 different cells. Each cell lives once per column. And uh, unfortunately for our question, all these cells are way too small to actually record from them with an electrode. So we did not know uh, the visual response properties of any of these cells. It was like a stamp collection, a map of silent neurons, right? And on the other hand, we had this beautiful model, this hassenstein reichardt model that faithfully describes at an algorithmic level the computations that are going on, you know, at this part of the brain. And, uh, but since it was only an algorithmic model, it was like a black box for us, right? We didn't know the correspondence between this model and the neurons that are actually doing these computations. And this question was actually around for almost half a century. And so it was like the holy grail of fly motion vision to me and many others in the lab. And every time you gave a talk about your work on fly motion vision and you stressed the point that this you know, hassenstein Riker detector model is such a beautiful model. You know, you get the question, which neurons are doing these computations, and every time you have to shrug the shoulders and, you know, uh, say, I don't know. So this was uh, very unsatisfying. So when I came to the Max Planck Society to Munich, I decided that I want to solve this problem. And uh, I decided to switch to Drosophila before we had worked uh, on big flies, on blow flies. We switched to Drosophila, and we wanted to use Drosophila with its huge genetic armory to help us open the black box. Right? So that was the strategy uh, that we took uh, 10 or 12 years ago. So for those of you who are not Drosophila geneticists, I just want to briefly tell you uh, like the essence of Drosophila genetics. Uh, what is this genetic armory that is so powerful that you can crack neural circuits with it? Well, at the base of Drosophila genetics these days is really the GAL4 UIS system that was introduced by Brandon Perrimon in 93. And what you see is that here you cross two flies. Now, one fly is the driver fly. It's the driver line, and this driver line determines in what cells something is being expressed. So it, this line defines the target of your manipulation, right? Because it provides the cell-specific enhancer, GAL4, or transcription factor. And the other line is the effector line to the right. And it defines what gene is being expressed and in what way the cell that is targeted by the driver line is being manipulated. So let's first uh, focus on the different driver lines that we have, thanks to a huge effort done by Gerald Rubin and Barry Dixon, now both at Genelia Farm uh, in the USA, 
we have driver lines for every cell type that we want to work with. And very important, we have uh, driver lines for the T4 and T5 cells. Right? Um, <clears throat> there is a collection that came out from a screen that covers like 10,000 different fly lines and with additional tricks called intersectional expression strategies, we can refine the pattern if, you know, a line is a dirty line that is, it contains the cell type that you want to study, but it also contains another cell type. You know, then you can play with these additional tricks to uh, make it more specific. Um, it's also very important that uh, these lines target all the neurons of this one type in all the different columns of the neuropil, right? So not just one or two, but all of them. So for example, if you block them, then you block them in all the different omatidia. Now, what about the effector lines? Here, basically, uh, we're working with three types of manipulation. The first one is a blocker. This one, for example, that you see here is called Shibiri. That's a temperature sensitive um, dominant negative allele of dynamin. And dynamin is a molecule, an enzyme, GTPA is used for vesicle recycling. So if you express Shibiri at the right temperature, then uh, you can restrict uh, vesicle recycling. And by this way, you deplete the synapse from vesicles and the neuron can no longer talk to the postsynaptic cell, so you block it. There are other blockers that we also use. I can tell you about that. Now this is, all, this is like one standard tool in the field. If you're interested whether a neuron is, is participating in a circuit, you block it, you watch the response either behavior or electrophysiology, and then you see it's participating or not. If you don't see it, then you know, it doesn't seem to have such a great impact. The second thing is an indicator. These are genetically encoded calcium indicators that allow you to record the neural activity indirectly because you use calcium as a proxy for the neural activity. When the neuron is active and, you know, for synaptic release, it opens calcium channels, calcium comes into the cell, it binds to this genetically encoded calcium indicator. This one changes the fluorescence, the neuron becomes brighter, and using a, a good microscope, you can watch and record the activity of the neuron optically, right? Very important. And another one is an activator. In this case, channel rhodopsin. When we express channel rhodopsin in a cell, then through light, we can activate the neuron that expresses channel rhodopsin and then can either ask, is the behavior elicited that we study? So is the neuron sufficient to elicit the behavior because we have artificially activated this one cell? We can also use it for circuit analysis. That is, we activate this cell, we record from postsynaptic cells, and then we ask, is this cell presynaptic to the other one? Right? So these are the tools that we're using. And now, back to the question, uh, what are the cellular constituents of this uh, hassenstein reichardt detector? And we started by asking the simple question, which neurons provide the input? Now, for that, you need to know that the photoreceptors synapse in parallel onto five different laminar neurons, L1 to 5, shown here in red. And these different laminar neurons then send their signals to different layers in the medulla. So somehow you have this splitting of this photoreceptor signal into five different pathways. And you ask which of these pathways is the motion pathway, right? And Max Josch, when he was a grad student in the lab, did these experiments. And he was the first one to record from these tangential cells in the lobular plate electrically with a whole cell patch recording from the soma of the cells. And you see a nice direction selective uh, response here to the left uh, of a vertical sensitive tangential cell that uh, depolarizes 
when the pattern moves down and it hyperpolarizes when it moves up, right? So um, we focused in our analysis on two neurons, namely L1 and L2, shown here in this electron micrograph, because they are the biggest profiles that sit behind the six photoreceptor terminals, are, are one to six in the lamina. And um, there was also a behavioral study indicating that L1 and L2 should be involved in motion vision. So we thought using recording from the tangential cell is closer uh, to the actual circuit, so let's see what's happening. Um, first, uh, I want to say that, you know, in all these and following slides, you always see the responses of control flies, that is sort of unmanipulated uh, flies, in black. And you see that in response to grating motion, up and down, the cells de- and hyperpolarize nicely in control flies. Now, when we block L1, then you see a strong reduction of the response. When we block L2, you also see a strong reduction of the response. And when we block L1 and L2, both, the motion response is gone altogether, right? So that indicates that L1 and L2 really provide the major input to the motion vision system in Drosophila. And as I said, you know, there was a previous uh, behavioral study done uh, in the lab, actually, of my PhD advisor, Martin Heisenberg, in Würzburg, that, um, you know, is uh, in agreement with this finding. Now, the, uh, th this was a very interesting finding, but it asked, uh, let us ask the question, in what respect is the signal from L1 and from L2 different? You know, from these experiments, it looks as if each of them provides like 50% to the signal at the final output. But um, is it redundant, both pathways? Or, you know, what's the difference between motion processing in one and the other pathway? And there, uh, the final uh, answer came from an idea that we stole from the vertebrate retina because people knew for a very long time that the signal of the photoreceptor in our retina is split into an on and an off pathway. One responding to brightness increments, the other one responding to brightness decrements. And using these gratings, you provide, of course, brightness increments and decrements at the same time. So how can you test this idea? You can test this idea by using single polarity edges, as are shown here on the left. So the upper one we call an on edge because it involves only brightness increments. The other one uh, is an uh, an off edge it provides only um, brightness decrements. And again, you see the signals of the control flies in black, and you see that they nicely uh, respond to these on and off edges. Now, when we now block L1, we get this extremely specific reduction of the on response, while the off response is still at the control level. So blocking L1 abolishes the on response. And blocking L2 strongly reduces the off response while the on response is still intact. Right? So all of a sudden, we see a very specific contribution of L1 versus L2. And we concluded that, like in the vertebrate retina, we have a splitting of the motion uh, in the motion pathway, photoreceptor signal is split into an on and an off pathway via L1 and L2. And in two subsequent studies, we showed that motion is actually computed within each pathway separately. So you have not one motion detector, you have two. You have an on motion detector that is only dealing with the uh, the motion of uh, bright edges, and you have an off motion detector that's only dealing with motion of dark edges. And that actually uh, was like the road of success for us, because first of all, it uh, all of a sudden provided a biophysically plausible way of how you multiply with neurons. Because without 
such a rectification and, and splitting into on and off channel. If you have two events, you know, imagine this grating moving by uh, these two photoreceptors, then you have um, two on events, you know, when the bright edge moves, uh, passes by, and you have two off events, when the dark edge is moving by. Now, a postsynaptic neuron, which is, which is supposed to correlate and signal motion then, should increase its signal if both inputs go up, but it should also signal motion, that is, increase its output signal, if both inputs go down at the same time. And this is hard to imagine doing that with neurons in one step. However, if you split the signal into on and off pathways and represent the off signals you know, in a sine inverted way, feed it into different multipliers, then those two multipliers simply have to show a supralinear response if both inputs go up. So this is way more plausible. Well, another consequence of this finding was that we could use anatomy to guide our next steps. And we could use anatomy because the fly visual system, as I told you, was investigated anatomically extremely well by several groups. And now we have even a full connectome of the medulla with really knowing exactly who's synapsing on what other neuron and how many synapses per column and, and all this. Um, so we knew that postsynaptic to L1, there are some interneurons that feed onto these T4 cells that then go to the lobular plate. So this is the L1 pathway. And the L2 pathway consists again of other interneurons that feed onto the T5 cells that then synapse onto the tangential cells. And so this made these T4 and T5 cells extremely strong candidates to be local motion sensing neurons. And after our finding of one being the on and the other one being the off pathway, it predicted that T4 cells should be the on motion detector and the T5 cells should be the off motion detectors, right? And so we tested this hypothesis by using a driver line that stains both T4 and T5 cells. That's shown here to the left. It's a confocal image. Um, and using then um, drive expression of a genetically encoded calcium indicator, namely GCAMP5, uh, um, and do two photon uh, imaging in the fly. And these experiments are done, uh, were done by Matt Meisek, a grad student in the lab, and Jürgen Haag, a senior staff scientist. And um, what you can see here in this uh, two photon image is simply the structure, and you can already see that the lobular plate this is here, uh, this part zoomed in, contains four different layers. You can already see that anatomically, right? You can see it here, uh, different, four different layers, and you can see it here as well. So there must be some meaning to these four different layers. So when Matt and Jürgen now stimulated these flies and recorded the activity of the cells, they used gratings. And when they showed grating motion from the front to the back, then they saw activity mainly in layer one, the most frontal layer. When they moved the pattern uh, in the opposite direction, horizontal motion from the back to the front, then activity was present mainly in layer two. And when they moved the pattern up, they saw activity in layer three. When they moved the pattern down, they saw activity confined to layer four. So you have, depending on the direction, directionally selective signals carried by T4 and T5 cells in the four different layers of the lobular plate. And when you now assign a specific color to each pixel here, depending on uh, the um, direction of motion where uh, this pixel responded the strongest, then you get this beautiful direction-specific layering uh, within the lobular plate that is carried by the T4 and T5 signals. So this shows to you that 
you know, T4 and T5 cells are directionally selective. They are local motion sensing neurons and they cover the four orthogonal directions and project in a layer specific way to the lobular plate. Now, in order to test the hypothesis that one would be the on and the other would be the off motion detector, you need specific driver lines. And so we also got specific driver lines for T4 and T5 cells and first repeated the experiment with grading motion. And we saw that both T4 and T5 cells show this layer specific directional tuning that we have seen before. Now, in order to test the hypothesis, of course you have to uh, turn to on and off edges and that makes the stimulus set now grow to eight different stimuli because you have an on edge and an off edge motion for each of the four direction and we tested that in T4 and T5 cells and when we presented this to the T4 cells we saw that T4 cells indeed selectively only respond to the on edge and very little to the off edge while the opposite is true for the T5 cells. T5 cells selectively respond to motion of an off edge and very little, if not nothing, um, to a motion of an on edge. So this finding made a very powerful dis uh, prediction. If this is true, then we should also see the particular contribution of on and off motion pathways in downstream uh, neural circuits and behavior. So we again now blocked the T4 and T5 cells selectively using these driver lines and recorded from the postsynaptic tangential cells. And again, you see in black the responses of the control flies. And what we found was that if we block the T4 cells, then the response to the moving on edge is strongly reduced while the response to the moving off edge is at the control level and the opposite is true when we block T5 cells then the on response is intact while the off response is gone. And I should point out that these experiments were done by three grad students in the lab, Georg, Etienne and Matthias. And uh, these were experiments that the reviewers of the paper sort of um, asked us to do and they did, uh, they just spent two weeks in the lab day and night, I provided pizza, and they provided the data, and they were, you know, <laughs> they were incredible. Anyway, now can we see the effect of these cells also in behavior? And for that we used a paradigm uh, where a fly is walking on a styrofoam ball that is floating on an air cushion. And uh, so here you see how Drosophila looks, when it's walking uh, on this little uh, ball here, and the ball is actually observed by uh, two cameras that extract the motion of this sphere and from that calculate the turning tendency and walking speed and all that. And um, these experiments were done by Alyosha and Tabea and Amin, and they found that it's very tedious to have just one setup and always you know, do the experiment for two hours and then you know, put a new fly on, would be way better, you know, data could be collected way faster if they had more of these setups. So we started to have our great ballroom where you know, six of these setups are sitting next to each other and after two hours you have data from six flies in parallel. And as a stimulus, we use this opposing edge stimulus uh, that is shown here where you have uh, opposing edges. So one is moving to the right, the other one is moving to the left. And one is of the on type and the other one is of the off type. And now plotted here is time on the y-axis. And you see that control flies during the time that this motion stimulus is on do not respond much because they have intact T4 and T5 cells, so they see on as well as off edge motion and they are in opposite directions so they null each other. There's not much turning. Now, when we block T4 cells, then you see that they follow the motion of the off edge. And the conclusion is they follow motion of the off edge because they are blind 
to motion of the on edge, right? So to them, this pattern moves to the left, right? And if you block T5 cells, we see the opposite. These flies now follow motion of the on edge, obviously because they are blind uh, to motion of the off edge. And this shows that these cells, T4 and T5 cells, are really the elementary motion sensing neurons in the fly brain. And you see this in behavior. You see that at the level of the tangential cells. And in other experiments that I'm not showing here is if you block both T4 and T5 cells, you have flies that are completely motion blind, right? Completely, but they are selectively motion blind. That is the nice thing. If you ask what can these guys still do, for example, in visual orientation, and you present them with a single bar, they will fixate, they will run towards the bar. They are able to do that. But if you rotate the whole panorama or you move the bar to the left or to the right, they respond the same, independent of the direction of motion. They cannot see the direction. So <clears throat> this was an extremely important finding. And I think I should wrap up uh, so we have enough time for discussion. Um, let me summarize what I have told to you. Um, in our quest to find the neurons that make up this motion detector, we have found that we're not dealing with one type of motion detectors, but actually with two types. Motion is detected in parallel, in an on and in an off pathway in the fly visual system. And we have identified the input neurons. These are the L1 cells that feed into the on pathway. And we have identified the L2 cells that feed into the off pathway. And as output elements of both pathways, we saw that T4 cells come in four different flavors according to the four orthogonal directions of motion. And they are selectively responsive to on motion. And the T5 cells represent the four channels of the off motion pathway. And um, let me just rush through the next couple of slides. Um, I think this is taking too long. Um, <clears throat> and let me come up with the uh, sort of outlook, sort of next questions that we're dealing with. And the uh, next questions that are coming up now is now that we have identified the input and the output elements and we know from anatomy which neurons are in between, we currently test these cellular candidates that are suggested by anatomy to play an important role by again blocking them, recording from them, etc. And we start to study the contribution of these different interneurons here uh, for motion processing. And once we know, you know their contribution, then the next type of questions that I call Reichert 2.0 is sort of subcellular. And that then asks how biophysically are these different delays in the input lines created? And if you think about it, there could be a different cellular dynamic due to different membrane properties, different ion channels in the different cells that makes their dynamic responses different. But it might as well be the postsynaptic transmitter receptor that is different, for example, that then has a slow or a fast kinetic like muscarinic acetylcholine receptor versus nicotinic ones, right? Or it could be an intracellular low-pass filtering in the dendrite of the cells. So that is very important to know. And the next important thing is how then is the, how do these signals then interact within the dendrite of the T4 and T5 cells and lead to that multiplicative like uh, uh, output that we see uh, there. And I think once we have asked and answered these questions, then we really have a detailed understanding of neural computation at the level of single cells and at the level of biophysics of individual nerve cells. And I think that motion vision could be the first example where this is really understood at all different levels in depth. And um, let me end by thanking 
Max Planck Society for the generous support, my collaborators at Genelia Farm uh, for providing these beautiful driver lines. I should really say without these driver lines, none of these experiments would have been possible. It's really essential for our work. And most importantly, I want to thank all the students and collaborators at my institute that did all these experiments that I showed to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>